Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you'll please go ahead and stand. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. How are you guys doing today? It is so good to see you guys today. Thank you for being here. It's Sunday, and it's not raining. How many of you last night were looking at the weather like, oh boy, we're going to be wet today under the tent, but God is good, isn't he? Hey, so this is a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, welcome. If this is your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. We are glad to see you. We can't wait to meet you. Um, if you would, if this is your first time or you've been here for a few weeks checking us out, or maybe recently you've moved, um, in the back on the table, there's a connection card. If you could just go ahead and put your information on that card, it's just a way for us just to get to know you. Um, we'd like to send you regular emails about updates on the church or things that are happening. We would, so putting your information on there, if you've moved or, or something has changed or you're not getting our emails, 
please go ahead and put your information on there just again so we can stay in touch with you. On the back of that card is probably the more important part of that card. Uh, if you have prayer requests, if there are things that we can pray with you or for you about, please go ahead and fill that out. After service today, there will be people up here that are wanting and willing to pray with you and pray for you. So you can hand that card directly to them. Or if it's something that you just want to um, have us pray for during the week, which we will do anyway, you can go ahead and put it in the box in the back. Speaking of the box in the back, um, obviously we are a unique church. Um, we are sitting under a tent, which we make no apologies about. It's just where we are. Um, but that makes us unique. Not many churches nowadays meet under tents. Um, one of the other things that make us unique is we will never pass an offering plate here at Christ Family. Um, while giving is important and it is something that um, we cannot do what we do without your help, uh, it is something that is between you and God. So um, in the box in the back is where you can put your checks if you still write checks or if you have a cash tithe or offering, you can put that in the box. Or you can go to our church website and give securely uh, at cfcc.church slash give or just go to the church website and the link is there and then you can give online there. Um, if you are a transplant from CCW, which is the church in Wikiwachi, Christian Church in the Wildwood that planted us, and you did have online giving that was recurring, um, now our, our banking information has changed a little bit. Uh, you need to go to C, uh, CCW's site and stop that recurring payment. And if that's something that you have questions about, you can talk to me or you can contact Nate Graham down at CCW and we can help you with that. Um, so a couple other important things. Our youth group was supposed to start this past Wednesday, but because of the weather, we decided, hey, let's keep everyone safe. Let's not burn down the neighborhood. Um, so we have moved the bonfire to this week. So the pile that's out there is still there. Um, that will hopefully, Lord willing, the weather will be nice and that pile will be gone this week. Um, but regardless, even if the weather does not um, per cooperate with our plans, because again, like we have said all year, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Um, but either way, we will be here on Wednesday, middle school and high school, um, under the tent, or we're not sure what that's going to look like, but hopefully back by the bonfire. And if not, high school, middle school, come on out anyway. Uh, we'll start about 6.15, 6.30. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Jeremy. Um, other thing, we're doing another work day. There's uh, still a lot of, of little things to be done there. Uh, some progress is being made with our building. And again, I know Glenn updated us a little bit last week and, and there will be more updates to come. Um, but there's some more projects that we need to get done. So the last Saturday of the month, February 27th, starting at about 9 a.m., we will have a work day here. And of course, as always with everything here at Christ Family Food will be provided. Uh, so the other thing I have for you, and I want this, something I want you guys to think about, and I'm kind of kind of leave you hanging on purpose with this. Um, think about... 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now. Um, I know there's so many times we look back over our life and say, man, if I had known this or if I could remember this. So think about 10 or 15 years from now. What is something that you want this church to remember? Or you want the people that, that show up 10 or 15 years from now to, to know about us as a church? Uh, let me pray, and then we will jump back into worship. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day this beautiful weather. I thank you for all the people that are here, the people that are watching us online. I just pray that even as we continue through this service, that our hearts and our minds would be open for your message. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, Christ family, why don't we stand and sing this song. Continue worship.
of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your In darkest times, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Yes, cause all my life you have been there.
Good morning, family. Just uh, was thinking about it this week as I was preparing. You know, just it's just a boring, you know, just a boring Sunday. Hang out in church. There's nothing else to do the rest of the day. You know, especially when when you're a Chicago Bear fan. You know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> in, in all actuality, I love Super Bowl Sunday. I. I we invite a few friends over and just hang out, and, and we hope for a good game. 
always hoping that, you know, our team gets in there, but, that, you know, that's once every 20 years we get in there. So, uh, you know, we, there's no Buccaneer fans here, right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah just a few? Okay. <laughs> we, we live in a, a very strange state. If I were back home in Chicago and I asked how many Bear fans were here, the, uh, everybody would stand and applaud. Yeah, but we're down here, so we got, you know, you know, we have we have Patriot fans, and you know, I mean, there's, we're we're all over the place. Uh, but but I, w- I was thinking about what would what would Jesus think about today, and and what we're going to do, and then I, and I put it on. Uh, he wants he wants us all to be at the ultimate party, the ult- ultimate Super Bowl party, whatever whatever party you want that to be. He wants us to join him. He wants us to join him in heaven. He wants us to be there where it's it said there's nothing but joy, no sadness. You know, so we're not going to care about what team wins wins the Super Bowl. I, I was reading in the paper about uh, several uh, uh, clergy in the Tampa area were asked about uh, their prayer requests, and of course, everybody's saying, "Hey, please pray for the Buccaneers." And the clergy are, well, I don't think that God really cares about who wins this game, you know. And, and I agree with that, because if he really cared, the Bears would be in the game. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying. So, But I, I was thinking about things that Jesus has told us, and I was reading in Mark this week, Mark 16, 16. Uh, Jesus said, whoever believes in me and is baptized will be saved. And then in Acts 2, 38... Uh, with the Holy Spirit's guidance, Peter told the crowd, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Uh, That for all who are are far off, that's us. We're the ones that are far off. So he wasn't just saying it, for those that could hear that day. He was letting us know for all of us, if, if we believe in him and we repent of our sinful life and are, and are baptized, you know, accept that baptism, we accept the gift of the forgiveness of our sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And my, my challenge for all of you, if you haven't, and not just those that are here, but those that are watching us online, if you haven't taken that step, if you're not there, please come and see us because nothing is more important to Jesus. Nothing is more important to the leadership here than knowing that you have a future in the ultimate Super Bowl party in heaven. So I ask you to be thinking about that, praying about that, not just now, but in the coming days and weeks. And, uh, but be thinking about that as the men come forward to pass out the emblems and let's hold them so we can take them together as a family.
Let's pray. Lord, Lord, uh, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for all of, all of our friends here under the tent and our friends, our friends unable to join us. Uh, we, we thank you for your love, for loving us so much that you gave your life that we may live for, forever with you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. The bread representing his body. And the juice representing the blood of eternal life. Did you guys know that the greatest thing <clears throat> that you could ever do for me was to be generous to my family, to encourage someone in my family, to be nice to my family, to love my family? There, there's something that, that it means more to me than anything you could ever do for me. There's, there's a joy that comes to my heart when somebody loves someone in my family. Just so you know, my family is not just the four people who live under my roof and uh, over here in Sugar Mill Woods. This is my family. I, I love you guys. It, and when I see you guys acting generously towards each other, it brings a joy to my spirit that I can't even explain properly. When I see you guys loving on each other and doing things behind the scenes for no recognition, I love that stuff. And you are good at it, Christ family. You guys are good at it. You are such a generous people. So many things happen behind the scenes that you don't even know because you love each other. I think that's just a micro snapshot of what it, how God feels when we do it. Uh, the joy that I feel, I, I think God instilled that in me, and I, and I probably speak for all of you when you feel the same way as I do about this, by the way. But I think when God sees you, your God's kids, loving God's kids, there's something special that erupts in heaven. And, and I've never been there, obviously, but can you imagine, I, I don't know, but can you imagine what the angels see when God fist pumps? Like when he gets excited about you guys doing it right, loving each other, uh, supporting each other, being generous to one another, I, I, I think God throws a party. And, and I think the angels get to see it. And I, and I don't know that, uh, what, what we'll get to see when we get there. But man, I think God gets crazy in love with you even more and more every day when you do it the way you're supposed to. And as I sit here and watch a group of people, once again, as Dale mentioned here under a tent that we love, I think... There's a specialness. The, the, the Holy Spirit of God was certainly here this morning. Amen? The, I mean, just in our power of singing to him, something special happened here this morning for sure, and it continues to happen. But, uh, man, I, I don't know what it looks like in heaven, but I bet the angels rejoice just super loud when, when we just are generous to one another and love each other. And as I watch this grow here, I, I just can't help but know that God is in charge of this church, that God is the one that's stirring all this up. And you know what happens? We get to see it, but you know, more importantly, our neighbors get to see it. And, and we had a breakfast here last week. If for those of you that didn't know, every fifth Sunday of the month, we have a breakfast. And there's a partnership we have with the breakfast station right down the road. And they knew it. They saw what happened. The, as the guy came and brought breakfast, he looked around here and said, this is awesome, y'all. But more importantly, he knows that several of you guys go there and eat regularly and probably are generous there. And, and, and probably have built some relationships. And I know our family has. You see, what we have can't be contained right here. It's spreading around our community. And our closest neighbor has felt that. And so I encourage you guys to, uh, you know, be influential where you go. Wherever you leave, when you leave here, be generous. Show them what we know we're good at here. I say a lot of this because I believe this Sermon on the Mount that we're going through is, is Jesus' way of trying to get it back to family, 
As I've mentioned, he uses the phrase, our Father in heaven, 16 times in this three-chapter sermon. That's on purpose. When Jesus repeats himself over and over, it's to say, hey, listen up. Pay attention, I'm getting ready to tell you. I believe this whole sermon, and really you could say Jesus' whole life was to get us back to family with God. Yeah, we, we tripped up for a lot of years and sin separated us from a relationship with Almighty God. And Jesus' whole job was to get us back to family. And, that, and then he, he preaches this great sermon. He gives his life on a cross, raises from the dead, and he passes the baton to a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and said, now it's your job. Go and make disciples. And that Matthew 28, 18 to 20 that I'm talking about, we call it the Great Commission. But that is our job. And aren't you kind of glad that those 11 disciples that were left said okay and took that mission to heart? Because 2,000 years later, here we are with many disciples making many more disciples because you're generous and because you are family and you love each other and you get it right. And I'm thankful to be part of this with this family of mine, okay? So let's get into the word. We are in Ma uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be starting in uh, verse 17 today. I'm sorry, verse 7 today, Matthew 7, 7. Um, he's going to talk, the heading on this in many of your Bibles is ask, seek, and knock. And, and this, to me, spoke volumes of what we just saw last week when many of you sat at tables having a meal with people you didn't know, being family, inviting them to our family. You see, when God says to ask, seek, and knock, as we'll read here, he means it. He will show up. You want to know God? Seek him out and he will meet you where you're at. I promise you. More importantly, he promised you. Let me read this up front and then we'll, uh, I'll go back and unpack it. But starting verse says, 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others that you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So we'll, let's go back to verse 7 on the slides, and we'll kind of unpack this. But let me just pray for us real quick as we move forward, okay? Father, thank you so much for this day. We don't know when you're going to bring a windy day or a cold day or a hot day or whatever day, God, but we know you're in charge of them all and we will rejoice and be glad in them. Uh, may this loving family, God, uh, take that commission, that great commission seriously to go make disciples. When we leave here, this is, this is our encouragement party, God, where we get together and we worship you and, and sing and pray and think and act for the kingdom, but when we leave here, real work starts. And Father, I ask that you will strengthen us and give us the words to say when we leave this place today so that more be, may be added to your family. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. Okay, so let's unpack this. Let's go back to verse seven. And this is just kind of a weird place to put this passage. So we talked a couple weeks ago, Jeremy did a great job on worry, right? Right before that, we talked about how Jesus kind of admonished the Pharisees that were in the crowd when he talked about giving to the needy and praying and fasting, how you should do that just to please God and not to please man. And he referred to those who did it the other way as hypocrites, right? You ever, you ever uh, been speaking to someone and, and there's a, enough people around to hear what you're saying and you're kind of talking to somebody but loud enough for somebody else to hear? This is kind of what Jesus was doing. He was preaching this message to his disciples so that they got it right. But there's enough people in the crowd that understood who he was referring to when he called them hypocrites. And then those were the teachers of law that should have been doing things the right way but weren't. And then he rolls right into not worrying, which I thought was kind of weird. And then he rolls into last week or a couple weeks ago because we had breakfast. Dale did a great job on judging others, right? Where Jesus says, don't go there. Do not judge others. Whose job is it to judge? <clears throat> right, not ours. I'm pretty sure I'd have it done wrong in a lot of ways. So you should be thankful that God did not put me in charge of judging others. And then he says, let's talk about seeking out God. So verse seven, let's read it slow. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek 
and you will find and knock and the door will be opened to you. These are red letter words, meaning Jesus is saying it. God in flesh says you seek out God and watch him show up. God is not a God that is, and, and, and I want to apologize real quick. If, if you, in your teachings as, as a youngster or however you were brought up in the church or somebody who introduced God to you, if you were under the assumption that God was some faraway rule maker up in the sky with his gavel and he just can't wait for you to mess up so that he can punish you, I apologize. On behalf of God, on behalf of his church, our family, that is an incorrect measure of God. This says differently. God is saying, you ask for me. Seek me out. Knock on the door. I'm dying to open it. This scripture proves that wrong, right? So if you have been taught that God is the mean bully that just wants to take the fun out of your life, then I'm sorry. He does have rules for us, though. He does have expectations for his kids. In your family, especially parents, when you raise kids, you probably had some rules for them, correct? And it was always, always, always for their good not to take fun out of life. So let's move on here. He continues on that thought. For everyone who asks, receives. For who? Who asks? Everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I, I love that song we sing about the goodness of God, right? I, I just, that, I love the way we sing that song here, but the goodness of God, this, we have a good father who wants to give you good things. Verse nine, he says, which of you, okay, dads, moms in the room, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Like we wouldn't do that, right? When your child has come to you with a need, we handle that need. Or if, you, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. We can't even say the word snake in my house. My wife is terribly afraid of snakes, but you would not do that, right? Uh, which of you if, you, if your kid came to you and said, I have a need, mom, dad, would not like jump to the chance to handle that need in a proper way. So let's go on to the next verse. Verse 11 says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts. He does not say all gifts, does he? If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven, that's the 16th time now he's referred to God, the great I am, as father, dad. Your father in heaven gives good gifts to those who ask him. Okay, should the answer always be yes then? Jesus is not saying anything you ask for, God will just hand it to you. He's talking about good gifts. Jeremy mentioned Matthew 6, a couple weeks ago, and he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. When he was talking about the worry of people, don't you think God knows you need food and he knows you need shelter, even this kind? God's there to supply your needs, I promise you, but ask for good things and see if God doesn't show up every time. When you're seeking out his kingdom and the things that benefit the kingdom of God, watch him show up. Has anybody here tried to outgive God? You can, it's impossible, I've tried. God gives more, he has more, everything is his, right? We know the earth is, and everything in it belongs to God. But he wants you to ask and seek him out. God will not force himself on you. God is a gentleman, if you will. He's done the hard part. He sent his son for us. You seek him out and accept that, but watch him open the door. Ask, seek, and knock. So, parents, we do have some rules in our houses, correct? And some of those things are immediate. I understand the rule things. Kid, don't touch the hot stove. Touch the hot stove, it burns you. There's an immediate repercussion, right, for the bad action. We know we have those for our kids. But sometimes it's tough to say no to longer-term things right? Teaching your kid how to share helps them down the road. You should brush your teeth before you go to bed. One, because it's gross if you don't, by the way. But second, if your kid wakes up the next day, chances are they won't have tooth decay. They may not have it for a week or a month, but somewhere down the line, it's going to, there'll be affected because you did not make them brush your teeth, right? 
So that's an obvious one. How about you should learn to share? You should learn to be nice to your younger sibling. Chances are in the morning that won't have be affected, but down the road you're teaching them to coexist so that when they get into the real world, when they're made to share, when they're made to be nice to each other, they're not lost and floundering around. You see what I'm saying? Some of the things we say no to aren't for the benefit of today. They're for the benefit of tomorrow. Oftentimes, God's answer is no on purpose. You've heard the Garth Brooks song, right? Unanswered prayers. Some of God's greatest gifts are the unanswered ones. I was wrong in my ask, God. I apologize. You had a much better plan worked out for me. A good plan. A good gift. So, what I'm saying here before I move on is the answer is not you ask for God anything and he will just hand it to you. You ask for good things and watch him give you the good things you need. The good things that help benefit this family. And I'm watching God grow us because we're asking for good things that benefit the kingdom. Verse 12, he says, this is amazing to me. So we just talked about how Jesus says, ask and seek and knock and God wants to give you good things. And then he says this phrase, and I, I'm still wondering why Jesus chose to put it right here, but he put, so in everything. I like that word, so. It's like, therefore, you know, based on what you know, th therefore or so. When you see the word therefore, you need to find out what it's there for, what he's connecting the dots to. So he said, if, if you ask for, for anything from God and seek him out and ask for good things, he will do that for you. And then so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. That sounds like a, like, okay, that's good advice. We should do that. For this sums up the law and the prophets. That's capital L, capital P, meaning the scripture as they had it at that time, the Bible as they know it, God's word. So let me get this right. I should do to others as I would have them do to me. And that sums up everything we've ever read. So on the Sabbath day, when young Jewish boys rushed down to the temple to get their teaching, their weekly teaching from their rabbi, and they were excited about it. And by the way, my prayer for Christ's family and God's church in general this year is to be more like that, where we get excited about God's word, when we can't wait to pour into this thing and find out what God has to say today, how much he loves us, how much good he has in store for us. I pray we get excited like that. We can't wait to rush down to where our Bible is and get connected to God. And so when these young boys, so everything you're telling me, all these scrolls we've heard for years and years and years, and it, the, the Torah, right, Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all the Psalms you've, we've heard that were read to us and Proverbs, them bits of wisdom and all the, the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, like all that stuff was pointing to do to others as you'd have them do to you. Wow. Can you like see a bunch of minds blowing up in the crowd there? because this is what it's been all about, getting us back to family, treating each other right. All them laws weren't so that you could have fun taken out of your life. It was so that we could love each other better and we could encourage each other and we could do the things that breaks my heart, that skip a beat, that brings joy to my spirit. More importantly, what, what it does in heaven when God's spirit is erupted because of you doing to others what he'd ha you'd have them do to you. That's an amazing statement. Don't miss that statement he put in there. This sums up all the law and the prophets. If you get that right, you've handled those last 39 scrolls, those 39 Old Testament books. All that's been covered by doing to others like you'd want them to do to you. That's an amazing little statement Jesus puts out there. He goes on and talks about narrow and wide gates or your Bible heading may say the path to heaven or the path to life. And it's Weird how he does put this right in there about asking and seeking and summing up all the prophets. And then he says this, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. <clears throat> Do you think that uh, conversely breaks God's heart? Knowing the sacrifice that he's done for you and I, and yet so many people walk down this wide road to this path of destruction and don't even know it. And he says, but 14, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Christ's family, Christian church, how sad is that? 
How sad is it there's people that you know that are walking down this path to destruction and we, and we know the road. Do you guys know that you are the greatest kingdom warrior God has in your circumstance? Not a single one of us can outdo you in your circumstance. God has you exactly where he wants you for the purpose of the kingdom. I can't go into your environment and do it better than you. You have the relationships built. You have the, the scenarios, the circumstances. You are God's greatest weapon, his greatest kingdom warrior in your circumstance. And chances are you know some people in your circumstances heading down this broad road that leads to destruction. And here you know, you know this little road is better. You know that it leads to life. And life's not talking about how great we can get it here. How, who wins the Super Bowl is cool for you if you're a Bucks fan because they're going to win. But more importantly, <laughs> or how healthy we, we are, who is the president or not. That's not life. Life is what happens after this. Life is what God's got in plan for you so that we can in turn watch as God's fist pump goes when his kids get it right. That's the excitement I'm looking for. And I, and I can't help but think that Jesus is talking about that. Now, this passage, maybe your mind goes two different directions when he says that. One is kind of how I just laid it out about the multitude of people or the not multitude of people. But maybe Jesus is also talking about there's only one way to life. And that's why the road's small. That's why that gate's small. Because Jesus is the only way to life. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Maybe there's two messages in here. You see, I think our culture has taught us, and maybe some people in your world have taught you that, well, if I'm just a good guy, if I'm just a good person, how many people you, you, have you tried to witness to that said, well, I'm a good person? But they, but they don't know Jesus. <laughs> they don't know the small gate. But besides, what is a good person? Is that defined by you or me or somebody else? Because the second I start thinking I'm good, so I'm, I'm, I get in God's word and realize I'm missing something. I've got to fix that. So you could be right behind me saying, well, at least I don't do what Pat does because that's a bad person. So I think God gets to define the good and bad people, correct? And, and they're defined strictly by who knows my son. Who, who's heading down that narrow road to that small gate, that small door? And I'm thankful that's the, that's the answer because I don't know what good is anymore. I mean, if you turn on the news or the social media, good is defined by many different levels, isn't it? Or maybe you've heard this. Well, I go to church. Family, can I tell you, coming here does not make you a Christ follower. Me sitting in the trunk of my car does not make me a spare tire, right? Sitting in here does not make you a Christ follower. The way, the truth, and the life, we're going to get into that in a second, is Jesus Christ, that narrow road. Do you have a relationship with him? That's all that matters. That's it. And, and so maybe this is the second part of the story Jesus is talking about. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, who are burdened, and I'll give you rest. So what is this way? What is this way to get there? Let, let's, I want to take a field trip over to John chapter 14 for a second. I'll have the words up here if you're turning there in your own Bibles. Just want to emphasize what Jesus says right before he goes to the cross. He's in this upper room with his guys. He's just got done washing their feet, serving them. I find it interesting that Jesus' last act of, his last teaching tool is a, is a method of serving as he washes their feet and tells them to go and do likewise. Imagine if you had one last lesson you could teach your kids before you left earth, what would you teach them? Would it be to serve other people? Man, I'd encourage you to maybe make that your last lesson. Go and serve other people. Do to them as you'd have them do to you and watch God explode on the scene. So here in chapter 14, verse one, Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen. His guys may, maybe don't. He's talked a lot about it, but you can tell they're surprised by all the things that, that happened this night. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, he's been talking about his father being God for three years now or more, and the guys still don't quite get it. But he says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? I want you to think about something. Imagine Jesus 
our, our Savior is currently getting your bedroom ready in heaven. He's tucking in the sheets just right so that when you get there, it's perfect, making sure the mattress is just right, getting the pictures on the wall level. I don't know what our rooms look like in heaven, but can you imagine that Jesus, our Savior, the one who died on a cross and rose from the dead, is currently preparing your future bedroom, your eternal room. That kind of blows my mind, right? That's an amazing thought that Jesus would think that way for me. And in verse 3, he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. Jesus does not break a promise. He will come back. And he says, you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas has to speak. You know, I kind of feel bad for Thomas. All the other disciples, I mean, other than Judas, uh, they don't really have a nickname, if you will, per se. But Thomas, we all call him what? Doubting Thomas, this poor guy. Uh, he just gets a bad name here. But here he has to open his mouth, right? Thomas said to him, verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is, chapter, is verse 6 here. Jesus answers him, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth in a world that's full of lies. Jesus is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He didn't say through your good works. He didn't say through your amount of things, the tithe money you send and the the, the times you open a door for somebody, the times you decided not to be mean to somebody, the times you didn't pull in front of somebody on a highway, all that doesn't matter. Jesus matters. Can I encourage you today, if you've not made that decision, Glenn touched on it during communion. If you've not made that decision to make Jesus Lord of your life, today is the day. Today's the day where we decide, no, no, it's Jesus' way from now on in my life. I want to invite you, we're at the end of this, we're going to sing a song and I'm going to have the prayer warriors come up and, and you can do that today. You can give your life to Jesus. We'll find a place to, I got a pool in my house around the corner. We can do that today where you can surrender to Jesus. The water's probably not hot, but it's more important you spend eternity with us in that narrow little door that leads to eternal life. I, I want to do that with each one of you. And Christ's Family Christian Church, on the other side of that, if you have already made that decision, you know we have a job to do. You know there are people all around us that don't know what you know, that, don't, that are on that road. And our job is just to tell you, let me tell you about this different path you can take. Because I want to spend eternity with you. And I love you too much not to tell you about the cure for spiritual cancer, the cure for spiritual COVID. Yeah, that vaccine's much better. That, that defines where we spend eternity. And so our job is when we leave here, and we've encouraged each other this morning, and I hope you, you stay around after we sing, and we just encourage each other some more and leave and go be on mission. Because I love people around me too much not to tell them about Jesus. And maybe it starts at the breakfast station when we leave here, or Margarita Grill, or wherever you go for lunch, and to go to your workplace tomorrow or wherever you get gas in your car, or wherever you, whatever restaurant you go to, wherever your workplace is, man, be Jesus to those people. The way, the truth, and the life. And you know the way. We talked about it all morning. I want to pray with you. I want to sing. And then I, pr I pray if you don't know Jesus, please come up and talk to one of the prayer people here. We want to do that today so that then we can be on mission. We can be that family that God erupts for because he loves his kids so much. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the path, first of all. Thank you that when we declare war on you through our sin, you still love us enough to not let us stay there. You came after us first. And you simply say, ask. I want to do good things for you. Seek me out. I will make myself known to you. Knock, and that door is waiting to slide open. God, is, you are so in love with your kids. I can't even explain it to, to the people that don't know you. How do they even get through this life without the peace that passes all understanding through the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ? And, and Father, will you give us the strength and the courage this week to, to speak up and to show people around us with our actions first, 
our loving heart first and then our words. And when it comes time for words, God, would you give us the words to say that we may show people this little path that is so beautiful that leads to an everlasting life that none of us have seen yet, but I can imagine what it's like. Father, challenge us today to be different in a world that's full of lies, that's, that's full of hatred and bitterness. God, we can show them love and mercy and respect and generosity that, uh, that I get excited about when I see it happen around here. And may this little tent uh, be full, too full. We have to buy another tent or we have to meet outside because of the, the amount of love we show each other. We get it right, God. That sums up everything. Everything you've been talking about for years was to benefit this time and this place for us. Thank you for letting us be your kingdom warriors. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. You are